My name is Iron Rensberg, former Vice Chancellor for the University of Johannesburg and Senior Associate to South Africa's Higher Education Leadership and Management Program, or HELM, as we know it. And so on behalf of our host, HELM, a program of University of South Africa, I extend a very warm welcome to each one of our speakers, panelists, participants, hosts, and organizers who are joining us from across our planet. We are most grateful that you've been able to find the time to join us for this third and last summit day. And we look forward to hosting you as we engage personal, collective and institutional learning, disruption, synthesis, growth and development. For the record, over the course of the first and second days of the Leadership Summit, we have consistently had 180 engaged participants, and we're most grateful for this. And so allow me to also extend a warm welcome to our summit co-hosts and colleagues from the Council of Arts and Sciences, or CAC, the National Association of Deans of Arts and Sciences in the United States of America. And so today we continue our dialogue and learning on the important theme leading organizational change for sustainability and development in higher education. And I ask that we keep this top of mind as we make our way through today's summit program. As our summit outline reminds us, the conflicts across the globe, including in Ukraine and Syria and many other places, highlight our shared vulnerability, heightened uncertainties, and how highly interconnected we are as societies, economically, socially, and politically. The ways in which the geopolitical context is framed shapes sustainability, development, and change. Higher education is impacted by all of these changes in terms of its core mission, financial sustainability, and economic and social relevance. This complex changing context raises four leading questions. For example, how do we locate higher education and its leadership to advance sustainability and development? Second, how can higher education leadership enhance its collaborative efforts for national, global change and stability? Third, what leadership frameworks can guide our thinking? And fourth, how can we as high education leaders monitor and evaluate our contributions? And in this slide, the sub-themes that we are exploring in particular on this third and last day are, what has changed in global and regional contexts that require a rethinking of the meaning and practice of leadership? in higher education. Second, what is required in relationship to leadership development that will allow for complexity thinking, agile and nimble capacity for change, and for innovation and fresh thinking? And third, what is the organizational setting or are the organizational settings in relation to, for example, collaboration, partnership and innovation, required for organizations to thrive towards sustainable change and development. Yesterday, following on from day one of the Leadership Summit, was highly productive and rich as we examined issues in academic leadership and management, how to transition into leadership, student success, leadership hotspots, mental health and self-care in the academe, enabling institutional cultures, and leading from the middle, leadership lessons from our academic deans. In these regards, some of the insights we learned included, what actually is student success? Who defines it? How would we know that we are successful? And in this regard, our priority we learned could be the development of graduate attributes. That is, well-rounded graduates are indeed evidence of higher education success, and that examples of such attributes are 
SDG or Sustainable Development Goal, Awareness and Social Justice Agency, and leadership and local global responsiveness. We also learned that mental health of our students and of our staff for that matter, should be a huge focus for higher education. That students and institutions are embedded in contexts that shape and accentuate mental health. For example, many students face crime and experience poverty daily. That creates, for example, post-traumatic stress syndromes. And that there is a gap in mental health support and treatment that requires remediation and a systematic approach, drawing on institutional, students, governmental, and non-governmental resources and capabilities. Given the complex contemporary academic leadership and management environment and challenges, we learned that and reminded ourselves that there is an ongoing need to pause, reflect, learn, act, and model leadership that compels leaders that is to set aside time in their diaries for investment in their present and future roles, inclusive of roles as scholar and leader. And in this regard, we learned that it's essential that we regularly reflect on, review, and develop bespoke, context-specific health support programs, especially given quite often the lack of preparation and support of being dropped in the deep end about the complexity of the committee system, the nature of university bureaucracy, coping with toxic leadership and disabling organizational environments that are often overwhelming. We also examined institutional culture and leadership founded upon the rich and lived experience of the discussants as they play out in respect of the complex location of University's Office of the Ombud. And here are some of the insights from that session. That the Ombuds is a no barrier resource and provides partnership to university leadership in creating an enabling environment. That listening to all voices and sharing with leaders potential blind spots is crucial for the connectivity of leaders to its university community. And that this requires leaders to be open to feedback from all voices, especially those experiencing alienation, that is within the university, to enable it in creating an inclusive and safe institutional space. We learned that people desire safety, a healthy, ethical, sound and trustworthy environment, and that ombuds contribute to creating such a safe haven for the university community and are also responsible for expression, expressing apologies, the conscience of the institution. We learned about the powerful interplay between institutional culture and leadership. The seduction of power and things can erode the psyche of good people who are structured within these powerful institutional spaces, and that it requires heightened levels of self-awareness and reflexivity for one not to lose oneself within these powerful spaces. Of course, leaders influence institutional cultures through the good or not good they bring into their leadership while recognizing imposed limitations of all the social and political dynamics within the university. And when speaking about leadership development at executive level, this conversation opens the importance of imminent leaders knowing what they may encounter in the highly complex space of the university. More thinking and reflexivity on the interplay between leadership and institutional culture is needed within such leadership conversations. And finally, we heard from three women leaders, one from each of the three cohorts, about their experiences of the Helm Women in Leadership program, and here are just some insights from these leaders. That more often than not, we come into leadership positions without any real preparation for the positions. Having to jump into the deep end, as it were, consider the uh, repeating insights. And the Women in Leadership program provided important support to the first three cohorts of women leaders 
starting with a focus on what they could offer in terms of strength and assets, starting therefore with as affirming, the affirmative, so to speak, and then emphasizing self-care as critical to leading with a full cup. That small peer learning groups met between sessions, combined with individual coaching over six sessions, each with a qualified and experienced coach familiar with a high education context. We learned that participants commended the safe space created to talk about challenges and vulnerabilities. It made them feel less alone, part of a network, a community of others who were experiencing similar issues, albeit in unique contexts. We learned important lessons um, that leadership capability is all within us and that self-care matters, again, the repetition, if you like, that you have to learn about how to pause and not react, but listen, consult, consider before acting. An important lesson learned was shared um, from one of the many guest presenters, that's Professor Mutwa, midway through the program, was that Leading was no more about being a hero, but being the host who creates space and a platform for others to do their work exceptionally well. And that there was a real value to bringing who they were, their particular ways of doing things as women, into the leadership space, that their voices and agency matters and had an impact. And finally, a particularly important insight shared, especially in the relationship to impact and transformation, was that change takes time. Yeah, you have to be patient, live your values, mentor, nurture, model, and prepare those who will come after you to take over leadership. And so while all went exceptionally well yesterday, we wish to encourage an even higher level of active participation today. And so my appeal again is that we make full use of our chat box to share key insights that we've learned from the session to share insights from our own experiences, to applaud a light bulb moment, and to share some keywords that come to mind as we reflect on the presenter's reflections. Kindly note that your questions are equally welcome, and we are, and these are an important part of our deliberations. Do post these in the chat box, and our virtual host will communicate these to our session hosts. Should you wish any one of the panelists to comment or respond to a question, kindly indicate whose further insights you wish to have. And so all the very best. And may this be for each one of us another day of learning, of sharing, of growing. And so today we turn our attention more specifically to leadership development with an emphasis on reflexive and practical experiences. We commence with a plenary session on the ecosystem of leadership, organizational change, development for change and sustainability, apologies, to be followed by two sets of concurrent sessions focused on building communities of leaders and on international models of leadership development, after which we return to the plenary for our closing session. When joining a concurrent session, please join your preferred session by clicking on the tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Once completed, do return to the main plenary page and then select your next concurrent session, after which you will return to the main plenary page for the closing session. I now hand over to our host for the plenary session, Professor Patrick Fitzgerald, our HELD program leader. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Rinsberg, uh, Iron. Uh, greetings to all Helm Summit 22 participants. Uh, good day, or as uh, Prof. Rinsberg has just reminded us, possibly good evening or good very early morning. Uh, he has uh, set up that we are looking at leading and managing change and he set out some aspects of the chaotic complex disruptive environment in which this change must take place and that has come up a number of times in the conference we uh, all will also look more specifically or less generically 
uh, at the ecosystem of leadership of organizational development for change and sustainability. So it's leading change, but it's also leading or facilitating OD, organizational development, um, in order to enlighten us, assist us, inspire us. We have uh, two OD experts and practitioners with us. Uh, we have Dr. Rande Aulik, who's head of school of organizations, economy and society at Westminster University. I must say I was very jealous thinking of a school of organization, economy and society. Um, that sounds like a school with tremendous scope. And we have Dr. Gary Paul, Deputy Vice Chancellor Resources and Operations uh, at the Central University of Technology. Speaking of OD, organizational development, which is, let's say it has the reputation of being one of the dark arts, uh, difficult, challenging, Obviously, it has its roots in the more pedestrian or mundane beginnings of Taylorism and 20th century work study. But in, in this day and age, uh, looking at the 21st environment, uh, where organizations are driven by many factors involving environmental complexity, and I suppose involving the digital possibilities, both pre-COVID and as they are currently playing out post-COVID. For universities, we are perhaps on a journey from an old normal pre-COVID to a new normal post-COVID, only this new normal has not been specified. So what this new normal is or is to be is what we are currently working out or leading and managing towards. Universities as specific institutions um, trace their organizational trajectory from the idea of a self-governing community of scholars reflected or consolidated hundreds of years ago uh, in terms of an academic hierarchical approach to organizational life and a separation of the academic practice from the various support services to the academic practice. Something which in the modern era has now fused um, and we have, as it were, moved in the 20th century to a more Fordist or industrial idea of universities driven by massification, uh, achieved, uh, underway in certain societies such as South Africa or aspired to perhaps in less development contexts. And um, with that, there came debates about, and I should say complaints, about so-called managerialism, corporatism, and various techniques imported from outside the immediate university context, which were appropriate or not appropriate, or perhaps not appropriately customized, or applied, or perhaps in certain instances, in made indigenous and more creatively applied within university contexts. Just when that debate seemed to be reaching some kind of uh, resolution, we have been again plunged into this new environment, the post-modernist, disruptive, some people say post-truth, post-knowledge, or at least post the accepted conventions of knowledge, uh, the world of 
a different, entirely different possibilities, also driven by digit, the digital possibilities of how a university can work both within real spaces or virtual spaces or in some combination. That has also been greatly exacerbated by the ever expanding mandate of what we expect universities to achieve or deliver on behalf of the society. In South Africa, this mandate has grown alarmingly since the advent of democracy. We've moved from the old verity that universities are about learning, teaching and research. Community engagement was added to that. But now we see codified, legislated, regulated duties, sometimes funded mandates, sometimes coming as unfunded mandates of innovation, entrepreneurialism, both in terms of the university itself and the fostering of entrepreneurialism in the graduates and in the, the broader society, economic development, especially within the context of the global digital knowledge economy, adaptation to the requirements of the fourth industrial revolution, cultivating critical citizenship and democratic values, which Professor Rensberg referred to earlier in the summit, facilitating access and especially middle-class access in emerging economies like South Africa, as well as equity, diversity, and development, and being an exemplar of such practices for the broader society. And lastly, but maybe as somebody like Donald Trump might say, not leastly, um, providing social leadership in a time of local, and perhaps even global political failure. And that goes to questions of social values, social aspirations, democratic practice, ethical considerations, and ways forward for society which have become somewhat dimmer in this post values postmodern, post many things that used to be taken for granted era. Now, responding to this might seem a big deal. It's a difficulty. Dr. Seal has spoken about and drawing on the research he did for his book on deans in the South, how often woefully unprepared uh, academic management leadership is often drawn from academic contexts and from academic career paths and suddenly retooled, rehealed, rapidly shifted into institutional leadership for which the requisite knowledge, experience, preparation is not there. He quoted um, uh, that there must be few roles in society which you would be allowed to do uh, with such inadequate preparation and such great responsibility. Although Dr. Seal, I can think of two others off the top of my head. The one is uh, politics and becoming a politician. And I guess the other one is parenthood. Um, but be that as it may, um, how well are our Man university management leadership. And that could include not only the retooled academics who suddenly find themselves in charge of strategy, budgets, human resources, um, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, but also the university managers themselves. Uh, although they might have made management careers, there is not necessarily a body of knowledge which equips them to manage specifically in terms of their own disciplines within the university context. So how well are they prepared not only to provide such management leadership 
but to provide such management leadership of change in an environment of great complexity, continuous ferment, disruption, and change in, in institutions which have embedded many past practices, and maybe inevitably so, and maybe there should be that embedding of the academe and of certain um, efficiencies of 20th century management practices. But how do we take such institutions sustainably, viably, and in terms of their old and new missions into being sustainable and optimally operational in the 21st century context and in emerging and developing economies where their contribution is so vital because of the fragility of many other aspects of the political, economic, and social institutions which surround them, in which they are meant to empower. We are wishfully, hopefully thinking that anybody who is in such a position of responsibility, who has been appointed, is qualified, will have these knowledge will be able to practice from the lessons learned from the body of knowledge of change management and be able to practice the od skills necessary uh, to 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 lead and manage this necessary change so that universities remain sustainable remain viable remain optimally effective relevant cost effective but have we sufficiently facilitated those knowledge and skills even in and within the leadership programs we do have? Or do we just assume that people inherently have this leadership and will kind of learn fast, will pick it up? Probably, and I guess this is what we, we're doing now, um, we need to um, deter, um, to prevent, failed change processes, uh, which damage morale, which are expensive, which cause organizations to be less than optimal, by facilitating talking about exposing people more to the vocabulary, to the concepts, to the lessons learned, to the body of knowledge surrounding leadership of change, and the requisite, sophisticated, often nuanced, often subtle, OD requirements that are coterminous with that. For that purpose, I think we need to talk about it more. We need to facilitate it more, be it in terms of the concepts, in terms of the case studies, in terms of the techniques, the change toolbox, and the lessons we can learn mutually from the experience of colleagues from other universities and from other systems. I'm going to um, ask Dr. Randa Alik uh, to ascend the electronic rostrum uh, to share her slides. If, uh, she should be able to do so and to make her presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to join you in this conversation. Um, I was struck so uh, by the comments that Professor Rensberg made and that uh, you made, Patrick, um, and the overarching thing that really struck me is um, how similar the conversations are that we are having in the UK higher education sector too. This is in terms of the challenges um, that we're facing. This is in terms of the conversations we're having about uh, the leadership role, the leadership purpose, um, and how that is enabling us to bring about the change that we need to make <clears throat> in, in our universities, our institutions, our schools and the like. So that's the overarching thing that has struck me is how much we actually have in common. Um, what I wanted to do was just to make a few 
opening comments. And I think the really interesting part of this session today will be the conversation that we will have uh, shortly. Um, but just to do a quick bit of context setting around um, the state of play in the UK and universities. So if, uh, with your permission, Chair, I will just quickly whiz through a very small number of slides and, um, and um, looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have following. So just as a brief point of departure for those that may be interested to know some of the um, background in terms of univers the university um, higher education sector, we roughly have around 170 higher education institutes across the UK and uh, in terms of the numbers for 2020 and 2021, um, around 2.6 million students studying in these institutions, uh, undergrad part-time uh, part as well. And um, the links are there for anybody who wants to look at any of that in detail. Um, again, lots of similarities about the types of themes that are dominating and preoccupying the leadership in uh, our universities, widening participations, looking at uh, student numbers, um, particularly thinking about the impact of Brexit, uh, thinking about the impact short term and longer term of the calling the cost of living crisis um, and how that is affecting the choices that our students and prospective students are making. Um, big preoccupation with graduate outcomes, graduate employments and questions around how fit for purpose um, our courses are in terms of preparing our students for the world of work. So all these are um, very common. And again, thinking about um, the things that um, preoccupy us greatly uh, in terms of those in leadership roles are those benchmarks. Um, so we at the moment are gearing up um, thinking about the National Student Survey for next year. Um, so that is something that, if you like, is, is dominant on our, on our um, institutional canvas. Um, and a lot of the choices we have to make are very much based around uh, the data that we get from um, both the National Student Survey and the equivalent for postgraduate courses as well. Um, other... Uh, things that are dominating our world. Uh, you've mentioned some of these already, um, Patrick. Income, uh, tuition fees, um, and concerns, if you like, around the impact of things like Brexit on um, tuition fees, the impact of some of the other things that are happening uh, in other parts of the world and how that Im impacts on our perspective intakes. Um, a lot of thought around um, positioning and the broader impact that we, uh, we as universities are having in terms of the economy and society and local communities. Um, and even at a very local level in terms of where our students live, and the people that they live alongside and the impact that they have on local communities. That um, is something, again, that we uh, are obliged to give thought to. And of course, um, the other overarching strand is around research. Um, that is something, if you like, that um, keeps um, the leadership up at night. So just on that then, so if the question is what keeps the leadership up at night, it would be, student numbers, student fees, financial viability, and how we're faring in terms of league tables. Um, so again, just as a, a wraparound comment, I agree entirely with what Professor Rensberg has said and what you've said, Patrick. In order to bring all this about and to move things forward in the way that is needed, uh, 
leadership, effective leadership is an undisputable and necessary imperative. So that goes without saying. And um, so many ways in which uh, leadership is important, including really um, painting a picture of future possibilities, an aspirational picture uh, that enables all those that work in uh, higher education institutions to have something that pulls them forward. And holding true to the purpose and the end game, as you said, uh, we're faced with a lot of complexity, a lot of challenge, and that can be quite cloying and, and um, difficult uh, in terms of uh, an experience. And again, I think um, the leadership role uh, is so important in terms of reminding us of where we're heading and why we're heading there. And um, picking up on the theme around change, flexing the organizational muscle to really drive through the change that we need uh, to build institutional and individual resilience and to ensure that uh, our institutions and what we offer is indeed fit for purpose. So on the um, leadership and OD piece, very swiftly, um, looking at the picture in the UK, the starting point is there is no one single best way, um, even in terms of um, the positioning and how an OD function or contribution might be structured and where it's positioned. In my institution, uh, we have a small, separate OD function linked to HR reporting to the VC. Uh, so historically we had that, then it was deleted, now it's been reconstructed. So it sort of ebbed and flowed. Um, and again, thinking about uh, what role the colleagues in OD play at its broadest level, uh, as well as looking at um, how we can strengthen uh, and enhance our leadership practice. It um, has a role in facilitating strategic conversations across the institution in so many ways and making sure that there is an alignment between the strategic direction of the institution and practice throughout the organization. So I would say it goes beyond um, the typical understanding that we might have about uh, OD's contribution in terms of um, learning and development, training and development and leadership development, that certainly in my institution OD has a broader purpose and a more embedded um, position. On your point about leadership, um, really interesting and absolutely agree, and it's a starting assumption that somehow we will all um understand what's important in terms of leadership and leadership practice as though it will happen by a process of osmosis and again i think it's interesting to look at the um entry level access so what methods are we using to select those that we select for leadership positions is it the tried and tested method is it taps on the shoulder or are we in our institutions using alternative, more imaginative, and perhaps even more robust ways of making those decisions. Um, I wanted just to um, flag up um, uh, an annual higher education leadership survey that happens across the sector. And again, we can come back to it, but it's interesting to look at the types of questions that uh, are asked in that survey. And um, uh, this one I thought was particularly interesting it is a uh, please rate the extent to which leaders in your organization are empowered and supported to do all these various things. Uh, and I think that is interesting uh, to look at as a, as a list of activities and to ask ourselves, is that it? Are there more? Are these universal? Are they somehow really capturing what we need to capture? So um, I'll leave that hanging there. Um, the other um, item I wanted to draw your attention to was around um, understanding what do those who are in the OD function think their mandate is, think um, 
uh, their approach should be. And again, um, a survey was carried out, a study done around um, how we might enhance OD in English universities. And again, it's interesting when the question was posed to OD practitioners in uh, English universities, what was rated highest was improving the student experience, followed by improvements to leadership and management, followed by teaching and learning provision, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, towards the kind of fourth tier, we had changing culture. And I think that is really interesting, that kind of positioning of where changing culture featured. Um, and as part of that survey, um, respondents were asked to comment on how they currently engage with OD and the university, what tools and approaches they use, how they saw their roles and what OD initiatives they were planning to engage with. And if we're looking at, OK, so what was the overarching conclusion from this particular survey? Fairly broad base around that each institution needs to find and adopt approaches that are very specific to them, that are very much rooted in the kind of particular context uh, and the particular uh, features of that institution. OK, so you might say, well, that, that kind of almost uh, what you would have assumed, um, but nevertheless still important. So then finally, um, in terms of my um, opening comments, it's really about uh, understanding how we bring together OD, leadership, leadership development, the organisation and the kinds of things that we need to achieve. And really keep in mind that broader question in terms of where we are and where we want to be. And is it that we're just, regardless of all the endeavours and all the interventions, still only treading water? Are we keeping up with the best or are we actually able to stride forward and um, be the pace setters? Um, so that's... Um, my final point, if you like, again, it's more leaving things hanging than nailing things down. And back to you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alec, uh, for managing to get uh, a very dense points across so succinctly. And um, without further ado, I'm going to call on Dr. Gary Paul, who may, in his turn, ascend uh, I think he's already ascended the uh, electronic rostrum and he already has his slide shared. So over to you, Gary. Good afternoon, um, Patrick. Am I, uh, am I audible? Let me first check that. Yes, you are audible. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. We are grateful as an institution to be able to um, share our experiences with regards to uh, an institutional change initiative that we are undertaken and for the most part probably concluded the shall I call it the technical work um, of course um, the the actual implementation of the change uh, requires both astute leadership and management um, as, as we've learned over time and through Randia's presentation and your opening remarks uh, early on given the um, external and internal forces that uh, um, um, bring themselves to bear on an organization so that's what uh, I'm going to be talking about for the next couple of minutes um, so you know, the, the, the big question for us in, in getting to the case for change is what is our why? Now, I'll, I'll briefly step through these points that I've got listed um, on the screen now. So the Welcome Campus, uh, let me say that CUT, Central University of Technology in the Free State in South Africa, in, in South Africa is the product of a merger. And uh, the merger um, happened between two institutions, um, that of uh, Free State Technicon and the erstwhile Vista University, which is the Welcome Campus. 
And so as a university of our size, we, we have a, a, a quite an expansive uh, growth plan. And, 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 and that growth plan is both organic and inorganic. And so um, for present purposes, I, I won't del delve too much on the differences between organic and inorganic. Safe to say that the Welcome Campus is an attempt to grow organically, optimizing what our available resources, optimizing the inherent capacity and capabilities of this campus, and to to properly uh, um, um, uh, situate this this, this campus. Uh, in terms of its academic profile and the impact that it can make in the Northeastern Free State. So it's very much part of our, our uh, strategic uh, outlook uh, in terms of how we want to position this campus. There was a call, uh, and I quote, decentralization of power, or, um, and that was from, the, from a certain stakeholder group, grouping, and as Randy said, I'll leave that hanging. Um, and I'm sure we would know uh, who that stakeholder group is. So I, I dealt with, uh, you know, the, the, the academic profile of this campus that needed, that needs to be reimagined. It needs to be rethought and brought in line to serve a transformational purpose in society. I believe that in order for uh, the knowledge economy to trans play its transformational role in society, it first needs to transform itself. And so, um, hence, it's a transformational endeavor for us. And, and part of uh, reimagining or transforming the way we, we think and do things at the Welcome Campus is to identify unique niche areas. And, and that will help us in some way to blur the lines between the Welcome Campus and the Bloemfontein Campus, uh, at the very least in terms of how we do things operationally. Um, it's interesting that the Welcome Campus, up until now, is only referred to in the university strategic plan. It doesn't have a particular um, position in terms of its uniqueness in our strategic plan. So that brings about that step stepchild syndrome, which I think is, is not uncommon um, in organizations that operate from geographically separate locations. So in doing so, you know, we've had to start a process while we are set up this, this endeavor to encourage our, our management um, and leadership capability to start reimagining this campus into what it could be so that it can become what it should be. And so uh, it's also certainly about enhancing the infrastructure on this campus I'm actually in welcome today as a matter of interest, um, as well as the, the, the HR structure. And of course, prop proportionality is critical in terms of resource uh, mobilization and allocation. So the process steps, and I'm not going to delve into the detail, we, we started out by conducting a benchmark study, looked at other uh, multi-campus institutions in South Africa and abroad, uh, We've done a, a desktop study, and uh, and then we had to figure out the methodology that we're going to apply. And so, I could only think of the carpenter's rule, which is measure twice and cut once, as opposed to fiddling around. I, I accept that uh, in higher education institutions, things are never black and white, uh, in and out, right or wrong, but you want to do things more methodically as opposed to being uh, all over the show. And so some of the methodological aspects that we took into account was to establish a task team. I initially chaired it, but I became uncomfortable because the Welcome Campus reports to me. And, uh, and so we, we appointed an external expert, uh, but, but certain stakeholders had, had problems with, with that particular um, stake, um, external expert. And we soon had to replace the person. And there comes in the messiness um, and, and part of the postmodernism that you referred to earlier on. Uh, so we appointed a new external expert and, and that person worked with the stakeholders and we gained much needed traction in terms of 
um, uh, crystallizing some of the salient aspects um, horizontally and vertically. Um, and the task team eventually pivoted into a, an implementation team. A task team can, can sometimes dilly-dally around things for too long and, and overthink things. And so we got to a point where we felt we, we, we've, we've got a, a model that we could start um, 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 working with and pivot it to implementation task team mode. And then, as I said, there was um, extensive engagement, horizontal and vertical. Concerns were raised. Uh, sometimes we had to go back and re-engage. Uh, but the value of going back and re-engaging is, is, is not to be undermined because um, that, that just strengthens the, the process and it, it, it enhances the cost of trust. And, um, and this proposal is going to council in November. So what were the, the factors that I think uh, got us to where we are now? I think the, it's, it's, it has to be the authentic stakeholder engagement, which included organized labor, not just resident at the Welcome campus, but also at the Bloemfontein campus. Um, the executive management committee, as well as the next layer of management, we needed to um, show our commitment to this process. The deans never the, uh, and, um, um, not at all uh, to be understated, um, uh, played a, a critical role because as, as I said in the beginning, this is about repurposing the, the, and, and reimagining the academic profile, the core business of, of this campus. There's some unique opportunities here. And so the deans had to go back to the PQM program qualification mix and look at how they can um, deal with the programs that are presently presented from Bloemfontein and, and, and are not necessarily supported in the way or relevant in the way that they should be at the Welcome Campus. And of course, the SRC, um, very, very important stakeholder in this mix. And so as it usually is the case in, in, in situations of change, where you are looking to grow um, horizontally and vertically, uh, the seniorization of the structure is an, an inevitable consequence. And of course, people want to see names in boxes. Why is my name not in that box? But, but we, we managed to deal with that by saying, look, we first need to figure out um, the, the strategy. Um, and hence, the notion of form follows function. And, and, and in doing so, while we couldn't provide absolute clarity, um, we, we, sorry, we could provide clarity, but not absolute certainty with regards to uh, who's going to do what at what level and when that's going to happen. But as the process evolved, uh, there's emerging clarity uh, around and certainty around the processes to be followed. The, the, a very, very interesting um, realization, um, colleagues, uh, in, in this process is how much institutional learning um, had, had taken place. Everybody wanted things to happen fast and furiously. So, for example, getting new academic programs to be offered uniquely from the Welcome campus. Those programs first have to be uh, developed. They have to be put through the um, accreditation processes. And only then can one say, all right, we're going to appoint an additional dean, uh, deputy dean, HOD, and, and such like. And so it was, a, it, it was and still is, and I, I suspect will continue to be a significant learning opportunity. And of course, Having said that, the management of expectations of all stakeholders, including the current incumbents of positions that will be repurposed and, and possibly seniorized, need, need to be managed very, very closely. And we've been able to do a good job of that so far. So the forces that, that I, I call them that, that need to be reckoned with. Firstly, as a, as a, gen, a general uh, principle, Job purposes change over time. If I can take just crudely 
a three-year time horizon. If you look at jobs that in the way they were um, conceived and carried out three years ago, I would argue that those jobs in terms of their purposes have changed. The question is, are we aware of that from an OD perspective? The skills uh, that, um, that were required three years ago, how applicable and relevant are they to the jobs as they exist at the moment? And if not, what are we going to do about that? The organizations, um, I made the point earlier in a, in, a, in a workshop that I participated. The organization, this organization, this institution, as we knew it three years ago, and most salient of, of which, of course, is, 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 is COVID, that uh, exogenously forced upon us a number of forces that I don't think we fully understand yet. And so the question is, what, what is the ask now? Uh, how is it different from what it was uh, three years back and why? And of course, the inevitable companion of change is resistance. And I refer to the change continuum um, where you have at least four levels uh, with its own sub-levels of, of resistance to change. And, th and, th and that's why it's referred to as a continuum. And I think that initially there was active and, 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 and it doesn't happen linear in a linear fashion. There's a vacillation between active to passive indifference and back to active. And I think we have been able to transition into a, a, a state of, of acceptance. Um, where all stakeholders understand that this is possibly an iterative process and we, we will not get the, 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 the Rolls Royce of, of products that we are looking for. An interesting insight that, that dawned on us colleagues is the effect and influence of the multi-generational nature of the workforce at the Welcome Campus. And just have a look at this. And I'm not gonna go into this. So, the, the multi-generational workforce, they, th those forces too, bring uh, upon an organization um, uh, uh, conditions that if we are not aware of what the different generations, I'm referring to generation X, Y, and Z, and now with a new generation emerging as well, how do we fashion the value proposition from an employee perspective? so that it's responsive to the generational um, requirements of, of, a, of an employer, uh, knowing that Generation Z are the ones who want meaning. They search for meaning in what they do. They want to pursue causes uh, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, being um, uh, so, so heavily connected and reliant upon um, technology as, as the previous generation, as an example. And so the key takeaways for us is um, you have to manage stakeholders and watch out for um, politically induced interest. There, there has to be clarity and support from executive and senior management. The main thing has to be the main thing. What, constantly we have to check in with, with our why and make sure that the why com continues to occupy center stage. We have to be open-minded. And, 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 and be agile in our thinking because we may be confronted with things that we didn't even consider were necessary and or important. Cost is always a, 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 an important variable. And an important uh, part of costing is to do your life cycle costing. In other words, don't just look at the cost of acquiring something, but calculate the total cost of ownership, also known as cost of uh, life cycle costing, and then keep it simple. Um, and, and, then, and that, I think, relates back to, to uh, the main thing being the main thing. And then, of course, as, as Stephen Coyle says, if you're going to rush this thing, you're going to end up um, getting stuck on, on, on first base. So uh, we, we learned and, and we, were, we were very watchful for that. So in, 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 in closing, you have to create the burning platform, inspire your people, share the vision, share the why, explain the benefits, strategic, tactical, and operational. Um, invite them, encourage them to help and to co-lead the change. And if we do that, we will empower our people. And that to me is the ultimate embodiment of leadership. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Gary. That was a great case study, um, which I think has huge learning potential on a comparative basis. I think we're going to be inviting you to present that case study at a number of our Helm Foundation of Leadership programs as a exemplum of change management issues and, and hopefully solutions. Thank you very much. We, we have about seven or eight minutes. I know it's limited. Um, we, um, we have, yes, I've been prompted exactly that. So I am going to come back to the panelists and um, it looks like eight divided by three is roughly two and a half minutes. So um, we can share them between the three of us and Randia, that will be you first. Um, okay, so um, what am I left with, if you like, in terms of uh, hearing the sort of various uh, and, and really interesting um, conversations is thinking about leadership, leadership development, leadership development of leaders to be um, facilitators of change and left with a question. So it's more questions and answers is what is teachable? Um, how much of it is best achieved by putting us all onto a training program and giving us models and methods and approaches? How much of it can be achieved and perhaps better achieved by the kind of uh, process we're engaged in today, which is uh, hearing about how others have done it and tried it and, and where that's taken them and learning by observing and listening and uh, learning by doing. I think uh, a lot of us that were thrust into leadership roles um, have taken that trial and error approach and then enhance that by talking to uh, peers, talking to others that have trodden similar paths in the past. Um, and then that <coughs> flags for me the importance of uh, knowing who else is in the same area of work and uh, events like this is so, so helpful in that process. Um, and um, really, really helpful to hear from Gary in terms of um, the approach that they have taken to bringing about change. And the, and the second and final point, if you like, I mean, there's so much one can say, is that in my institution, we have an outstanding leadership team that are uncompromising in terms of where they stand on um, very important issues. And it's a very values driven institution. Um, our VC is superbly um, uh, unapologetic in terms of making that really clear. And that has permeated throughout uh, the institution and if you like, uh, the leadership elsewhere and throughout the institution. So I think that whole uh, connect between leadership from the highest level of the institution, the messages they're sending, the role modeling they're doing um, is so critical so that you can see consistency in terms of um, how we practice leadership and how we manage change. So I suppose it's just reminding us all again of how um, what happens from the very top um, can have a domino effect throughout. And again, I'll leave it there, Patrick, in the interest of time. Thanks, Randia. Gary, um, two minutes for you to say anything, maybe something more generic, but uh, you need to leave me two minutes to sum up. All right, uh, Patrick, somehow I, I don't know, am, am, I, am I visible and audible? Uh, yes. I, I, yes. Okay. Oh, oh, uh, 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 yes on both. Okay. All right. So I, I, I have been in higher education for, for a while and I, and I know that um, uh, there, there's variable um, appetite for what is referred to as, as, as corporatization of higher education. I have come to, to learn though that 
higher education institutions uh, are not uh, insulated from, from the forces that play out on any type of organization, whether it be an NGO, whether it be a government a department, whether it be a, an NPO or even a, 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 a corporate organization. And I think we need to make peace with the fact as higher education institutions that, and, and as, as cheesy as it may sound, you know, that change is going to be the constant. And we're going to have to be open-minded and learn, uh, import some of the ideas that some of the corporates um, use, but repurpose them so that they make sense uh, in, in, in the higher education space. So um, I think that that's an important mindset shift, um, but it's also a, a very important um, uh, operating principle uh, to adopt. The second thing is um, resilience for me is, is the key word um, in, in the face of uh, possible um, pushback and, and resistance in the process of, of, of designing and implementing uh, change. And I think um, that is a very important life skill that we need to teach every uh, or um, uh, get our employees to imbibe and most certainly our managers and our leaders in the organization. I believe that, it, this is my closing statement, I believe that every employee, regardless of her or his um, position in an organization, that they are a leader and Thank should you. be treated as one or and be required to conduct themselves as one. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Less than a minute before the session automatically closes, my takeaway is generic leadership development is great, but developing leaders without management development and requisite relevant skills can be a recipe for toxic leadership. So within that management leadership development, there needs to be direction, there needs to be relevant industry sector content. And I'm very happy that we had this OD session in the plenary that we are popularizing these issues because OD had the habit of presenting as a kind of peripheral thing in a small session on the side of higher education conferences and discussions, whereas something that is now moving to center stage for the exact reasons that both Randia and Gary have eloquently, eloquently explained. Thank you very much, folks. Hope you, uh, received some benefit from the session. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And colleagues and those of you who are still with us, uh, thank you so much uh, for going the distance. <laughs> it's been a fantastic uh, long three and a half days, uh, three days. Um, I think some, some great insights um, and some, some really dynamic engagements that we were part of. And we really salute you for being with us, uh, for being invested uh, in the summit and supporting us at home with the work that we do, obviously in partnership with our, with our, co our partners, uh, CCAS. I'd like to hand over to Professor Iron Rensberg to provide kind of his closing uh, comments, uh, remarks on the kind of experience in the last three days. And then we'll wrap it up with some announcements from Helm and then uh, just close down with a vote of thanks. Over to you, Ira. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Oliver. Um, uh, so as we now bring our summit to a close, allow me to make some overarching summative observations. Um, and I promise it won't be more than five minutes. And so for the course of the last three days, we have dialogued and drawn many lessons on the theme leading organizational change for sustainability development in higher education. We undertook this within the ever-present and troubling context of rising populism, nationalism, racism, xenophobia, and exclusion. We examined the geopolitical and economic crises confounding us of rivalry and polarity that places our planet on the brink and at the risk of defaulting to a new Cold War. 
and that adversely impact personal and academic freedoms, global collaboration, and because of alleged concerns for national security, places critical global research collaboration on the grand global challenges at grave risk. We recognize that the new sciences and technologies are in complex ways shaping knowledge transmission and production, and that this should be carefully evaluated and substantively addressed. We acknowledge that higher education is experiencing an existential crisis relating to science, knowledge and truth, and that the academic and university trust factor is directly implicated. We carry immense responsibility for nurturing the idea of knowledges and pluralism and of decolonization as an important means for resetting the concept of knowledges in both the South and the North. That universities are the preeminent institutions for advancing constitutional democracies and of social and economic justice and inclusion. That the higher education system lacks capacity to meet rising demand, including for an expanded role in upskilling, retooling, and alternative credentialing, and that the quality of our programs requires urgent consideration and attention, including in terms of the pervasive and ubiquitous use of the new technologies and its impact on graduates' job and career opportunities and futures. On the health, climate, environment, and social grant challenges, we acknowledge that higher education research is simply not suited for mounting an appropriate response, and that this requires a shift to a focus on solving local problems as research and as student engagement, and engaging in effective partnerships with peer institutions and the private sector. That existing economic models reinforce the under and defunding of higher education, thus exacerbating privatization, exclusion, inter-institutional funding, infrastructure and talent gaps, such as between historically black and historically white institutions, and inter-nation gaps, when considering participation, graduation, and research innovation systems and outputs. We also learned from colleagues' personal leadership journeys about their leadership organizing frameworks and what motivates them, including sharing their insights on a range of matters such as self-awareness, self-regulation, the nurturing of positive psychological capabilities of confidence, hope, optimism, and resilience, of dedicated and ongoing learning, and of the importance of consistent and effective communications, and that these constitute some of the essential elements of nurturing and modeling transformational leadership. We learned of the roles and purposes, values, setting, very high ethical standards, learning from our colleagues and peers, of visioning, strategy development, and strategic plans in achieving shared ambitions. About the importance of being leadership role models that listen actively, are caring, and who continuously learn, adapt, and are agile. We acknowledge that leadership is distributed within teams and across the institution and how to mobilize and achieve leadership and strategy alignment. We learned about leading in crisis and that leadership programs should be imbued with the requisite management and leadership skills that are relevant and industry or sector specific. We also examined issues in academic leadership and management, the transition into leadership, key questions and issues impacting student success, mental health and self-care in the academe, enabling institutional cultures and leading from the middle, leadership lessons from academia.
academic deans. In these regards, some of the insights we learned included that our priority should be the development of graduate attributes and that examples of such attributes are SDG awareness and social justice agency and leadership and local and global responsiveness. We learned that the mental health of our students and our staff should be a substantial focus of higher education and that students and institutions are embedded in contexts that shape and accentuate mental health and that there is a gap in mental health support and treatment that requires remediation and a systematic approach drawing on institutional, students, governmental and non-governmental resources and capabilities. But given the complex contemporary academic leadership and management environment and challenges, there is an ongoing need to simply pause, to reflect, learn, act and model leadership. And that this compels leaders to set aside requisite time in their diaries for investment in present and future roles, inclusive of their roles as scholar and leader. In this regard, we learned that it's essential that we regularly reflect on, review, and develop bespoke context-specific help support programs, especially given quite often the lack of preparation and support being dropped in the deep end, the complexity of universities' committee systems, the nature of university bureaucracies, toxic leadership, and disabling organizational environments that are often overwhelming. We learned that there is a powerful interplay between institutional culture and leadership, that the seduction of power and things can erode the psyche of good people was structured within these powerful institutional spaces. And it requires a heightened level of self-awareness, self-regulation and reflexivity for one not to lose oneself within these powerful spaces. Of course, leaders do influence institutional cultures through the good that they bring into their leadership and sometimes the not so good that they bring into their leadership while recognizing imposed limitations of all the social and political dynamics within the university. And when thinking about leadership development and executive leadership, this conversation opens the importance of eminent leaders knowing what they may encounter in the highly complex space of the university. And that more thinking and reflexivity on the interplay between leadership and institutional culture is needed within leadership conversations. We learned that more often than not, we come into leadership positions without any real preparation for the position, having to jump into the deep end as it were, and Helms Women in Leadership pro Program provided important support to the first three cohorts of that program of women leaders, starting with a focus on what they could offer in terms of their strengths and assets. So a positive approach to leadership development and then emphasizing self-care as critical to leading with a full, not a half empty cup. We learned that the creation of safe spaces is essential for colleagues to talk about challenges and vulnerabilities and that such conversations made them feel less alone and a part of a network of a community of others who were experiencing similar issues, albeit in unique contexts. That leading was no more about the leader being the hero, but the leader being the host who creates space and a platform for others to excel. That there was real value to bringing who they were their particular ways of doing things as women into the leadership space and that their voices and agency mattered and had an impact. That change takes time. One has to be patient, live your values, mentor, nurture, and prepare those who will come after you to take over leadership. And finally, 
we learned that context, past, present, and future, complex, challenging, troubling, and often confounding, all shaped and are shaped by higher education institutions. And importantly, let us not forget our relative autonomy to help shape these circumstances that are shaping our experiences and our institutions. And so colleagues, many thanks. It's been a very special privilege and an honor to moderate this landmark Helm Leadership Summit. And I'll hand back to Dr. Oliver Seal, the director of the Helm Program. Oliver. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. As always, you, you inspire us, you, you challenge us, uh, you energize us you know, to remain in the trenches, uh, to be committed to the cause uh, of higher education, not just in our own countries, but across the globe. So on that note, uh, I really want to express our appreciation to you on how you stewarded us um, um, at the helm of the ship, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, uh, of the last three days. Uh, I think it was really uh, for us uh, setting the tone and, and holding it all together. We are deeply appreciative of, of the work that you still do um, and that the investment you've made and the commitment you've made to us at Helm um, to continue doing that into the future. So thank you very much uh, for, for that from all of us, uh, and particularly for myself. And then I speak on behalf of the CEO uh, of, of USAF, uh, Dr. Petiwa Matutu. So I think colleagues, it's exciting uh, for us to wrap things up. Um, I've just got some statistics from the our technology support team and, and it's been our first sojourn into, into a global event as Halm. And, and we think it's been a success in the sense that I was really fascinated by how many people joined us from across um, the world in different time zones and the participants and more so also the, the, the presenters um, and, and some of our, our, our panelists. So we had participants, participants, I've been told from the statistics from seven countries, uh, the bulk of them obviously from South Africa. We have participants from the US, participants from the UK, from Uganda, from Zimbabwe, from Germany, and from China. So I think uh, it's a really, I mean, cutting across most of, um, you know, parts of the world, most of the various continents, it's been a fantastic experience for us, and, and we appreciate the fact that you had supported us and you had uh, been here and walked alongside us until uh, the, the last day today. So for 2023, we will be putting our new programs in place. Uh, as my as chief marketing officer for Helm, I remind you to keep an eye out for this um, on our website, which is www.helm.ac. Dot za or as the Americans would say, dot ac dot za helm uh, dot ac dot za, and there you'll find information uh, for our programs will be available by, by mid December for what activities, events, uh, and that we will have in place for next year. Uh, we also mentioned, and I think uh, Dean Tumbeni was was on uh, one of the sessions. Um, that uh, we have a partnership now with Gibbs, the Gordon Institute of Business Science, which is fantastic. We'll be working with Gibbs and developing joint programs in various areas from emerging middle management, senior management, and executive leadership program. A particularly exciting development is our student administration and student success program called SAS. Um, and that's going to be launched um, around April next year. In collaboration uh, with Kip. So we're really excited about a lot of work, lots of consultation uh, gone into that. And, and, and Dr. Birgit Schreiber, who's here with us and her team, uh, supported by Cindy Kai, uh, has done tremendous work in that space. So we look forward to that with excitement. And again, watch our, our website for information on that. <clears throat> we'll also be piloting what's called the Gen X program for student, student leaders, in particular, helping them to prepare themselves for a different world of work. I think leadership, not just for university uh, administrators or university academics, but also for students because they're the future leaders uh, of the country and of the world. And I think it's important that we invest in that. So uh, look out also for information around our Gen Next program, which we will pilot uh, uh, in 2023. 
And then uh, I think towards the end of, of, of next year, we're planning to host our first Dean's Institute, which will be a regional event, hopefully with international, regional and local deans. Um, this is a specific role uh, function, I think, which is critical in our university. So we want to support our deans and of course, uh, initiated by our fantastic partnership with, with the, the Council for Colleges of Arts and Sciences, is, um, who are partners uh, with this particular event. And so we'll probably work on that and also provide you with more information uh, as that goes along. Um, we will send you evaluation to complete. We know not, not everyone is, is still on the platform, so we'll send it to you via email tomorrow, so keep out an eye for the piece. Complete the evaluation form. It's important for us to know what your experience has been, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and what we can do better um, in future uh, as, we, as we move along um, with Helm. I think we, we, we kind of, I always say to the Helm team, we're kind of moving into a next level. I think the fact that, that, that the technology allows us to engage internationally, globally, at the same time, um, you know, on common issues. I think we've discovered in the past three days, there's a lot more that binds us together than divides us. And I think we must really, that common sense or unity of purpose we need to strive for as a global higher education system to support um, each other and learn from each other. So that's been a major take out for me. So. In, in closing, uh, I'd like to really express my deepest appreciation and thanks, first of all, um, to our keynote speaker, Dr. Marshall Sikikwa, who is the, de the Deputy Director General for Imparts, and of course, the ongoing support from the department uh, for all the work that we do at home. Also, our University of South Africa Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Pitiwe Matutu, uh, thanks to you for your leadership and your support uh, of, of the work that we do in home. Again, just thanking our program director, Professor Iron Rensberg, for his inputs, for his guidance, for, uh, for his support uh, in the planning and the delivery of this, this massive event. To our co-host, uh, CCAS, um, the Council for Colleges of Arts and Sciences, especially the president of CCAS, Professor Dolores Godedo, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, at this exciting event and for sharing your experiences and your pearls of wisdom with us in the various sessions. I think this has been a landmark achievement for us at home to be able to partner uh, with uh, an organization of your status and stature um, and, and this very exciting. And of course, also supported by the executive director of CCAS, Amber Cox. The session hosts, uh, there's some of you in the room, our international, our regional, our local speakers and moderators. It was a fantastic mix of people from all walks of life with a common love uh, for, for, for the ac academy and also the commitment to the, to the future of our universities. We always say in our country, if our universities fail in South Africa, then our country fails. And I think it's important that we stay the course. So thank you so much uh, for your public service. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your time in preparing your inputs. Thank you for being here with us and for sharing those, those uh, experiences with us. We are better uh, for it. To our organizing committee, of course, led by uh, Nolis Indiso Kai, so Cindy, supported by Bernadette Johnson, Dr. Bernard Johnson, Dr. Carolyn Stefanko. Carolyn is our international associate so based in Atlanta. And of course, our wordsmith of note, um, uh, Patrick Fish. Uh, to all of you, thank you so much. Um, to our technology team, our administration team, and again, Cindy's leadership, Tseto, Moratello, and Michelle, for your back office support. I think without you, uh, things will not be possible. Um, then to Louis Akuta Productions, uh, to Zanik and her team for the fantastic support uh, that you've provided us at this event. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I think uh, you've really put the stamp of quality of an event. I think that was of a, of a, of a world-class nature. So thank you very much for that. And finally, the biggest vote of thanks goes to all our participants, uh, those of you who are sitting in international and regional spaces and our locals, thank you, thank you, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for staying the course. Thank you for being invested. Thank you for allowing us into your world, you coming into our world, listening to us, engaging with us. We really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you again at the next Helm event. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Have a good evening. Have a good morning. Have a good night. And we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. And goodbye.